My name is Mari McAuliffe. I head up the Migration Research and Publications Division in the International Organization uh, for Migration. We're delighted uh, to be with you this afternoon to really take a deep dive and, and hear about the fascinating research findings from MIDEC on gender and migration. And I'm really delighted to be able to be here with UNRISD, our UNRISD colleagues. This is a joint IOM UNRISD uh, panel this afternoon and our researchers, as well as our distinguished uh, guest who we'll hear from uh, a bit later. So let's just restock, rethink, have a discussion on gender and migration. It's a critically important uh, topic. It uh, has become more important uh, over time, that is uh, for sure, particularly as we know that gender is integral in terms of international migration, international migration and displacement, as some of the colleagues pointed out earlier uh, this morning. It has always been a gendered process. We can't get away from that. Gender norms and the roles uh, of uh, gender in community influence the migration cycle from aspirations and abilities to migrate before departure. They transcend migration routes and how people actually embark on their migration journey, as well as the choice of destination country and also in terms of the return of migrants too. They influence the type of migration status, the type of employment or education, the inclusion within societies and communities as well as reintegration in countries of origin. Today, the evidence points to an increasing global gender gap in migration regarding the share of international migrants. So female migrants since the year 2000 has decreased proportionally uh, compared to males. In 2020, there are 146 male migrants and 135 female migrants, with the female to male ratio widening since the 1990s, from 51.9% in 1990 to 48%. Across diverse migration scenarios, migrants of all genders face intersecting vulnerabilities and have different needs that require tailored support throughout the migration cycle. Female migrants in particular continue to face some of the most pervasive forms of discrimination that impact their well-being and the safety of their journeys. Evidence research and analysis can help us better understand how gender roles and norms inform migration patterns and gendered experiences in order to devise appropriate gender responsive programming and policy making across diverse migration scenarios. As you heard earlier from uh, the Director of the Department of Policy and Research in this morning session, IOM has recently launched a new initiative called the Gender and Migration Research Policy Action Lab, or GenMIG, and many of our partners are actually uh, with us today as part of gender, uh, GenMIG. It addresses migration and gender equality through evidence-based impact research designed to support gender responsive policies. The GenMIG initiative highlights the significance of addressing systemic inequalities in international migration and recognises how empowering all genders unlocks the positive impacts of migration globally. This session and this panel focuses very squarely on these aspects and we're going to hear a range of different perspectives and key findings, including those especially undertaken as part of the MIDEC uh, project and the Gender Hub aspects. We have with us today an esteemed panel, as I mentioned, of speakers, and I thank you all for coming and joining us um, today, including from some very far-flung places. Um, so thank you for traveling uh, to be with us. We have on the panel uh, Dr. Matthew Walsham from the University of Manchester, Dr. Tony Seller from the Inter-University Institute for Research and Development, Professor Mary Satrana from the University of Ghana, and next to me is Ambassador Yvette Stevens. She is an executive in residence from the Geneva Centre for Security Policy. Online, we're delighted to have Jean de Kuna, who is a senior global advisor on international migration at UN Women and will be the discussant for this session. She's not able to be with us today, but she's joining us virtually. 
And also many thanks to Maggie Carter, who's the rapporteur for this particular session, and she's a research analyst at UNRISD. And we will have closing remarks from Katya, um, because we have organised this panel and Katya will be providing uh, brief remarks right at the end, which we're very grateful for. Thank you so much, uh, Katya. So before we begin um, the session, just wanted to mention the Q&A because we have our online participants. There is a chat function in the Q&A. Maggie will be driving the bus on that and she'll be giving us the, the questions out of the Q&A. We will uh, have 10 minutes from each of our panelists who will be presenting research findings as well as um, Ambassador Stevens will be providing her really deep experience both in the UN system and also as an ambassador for the government of Sierra Leone um, on the topic of gender and migration. And then we will be hearing from our discussant, Jean, and going to the questions. So we've got quite a bit to cram in. The objective is the pan of the panel is to finish slightly early. So we'll see how we go. <laughs> it's, that's going to be a challenge. So we'll see how we go. We have um, started a little bit late. So we, uh, we have an hour and a half now. We will try and do our best. But we also want to make sure that there is rich discussion, lots of questions. We can have some debates going on as well. We can offer our own um, lived experience and insights as researchers, as migrants. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat and when we get to the Q&A, please raise your hands um, so that we can see you. I will now turn to our first speaker who is Matt Walsham from the University of Manchester and he will be taking us through his, well, book chapter actually, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. okay. Thanks very much, Maureen. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Matt Walsham from the University of Manchester, um, working on the Gender Thematic Work Package, um, along with colleagues at the University of Manchester, so Tanya Bastia, and from Queen Mary, so that's Nicola Piper and Kavita Datta, um, and also Katya, who's been a really active member of the Work Package throughout the process. So um, what I'm going to present today is, yeah, broadly speaking, I'm going to talk to the chapter in the, in the policy report um, that kind of synthesizes the findings that we um, have from the uh, um, different country corridors that we're working with. Um, and then um, I'll be passing over to colleagues uh, sitting alongside me here, Tony and, and Mary, who will be presenting in a lot more detail uh, specific findings from their uh, country experience. Um, so just to say very quickly, um, with the gender work package, we, we focused mostly on three corridors, Nepal, Malaysia, Ghana, China, Haiti, Brazil, um, but really there are gendered findings from across the project. So we have a special issue in process on, on um, the gendered migrant body, um, and actually most of the countries and country corridors are contributing to that because everybody obviously is finding that you know, uh, uh, migration and inequality requires you to engage with gendered inequalities in every context, everywhere, really. Um, in terms of the approach that we took within the work package, um, we had a series of research questions. Again, you can look in the report for more detail, but one of the kind of big framing concepts was to think through um, how intersectional inequalities are themselves gendered. So that's how race, gender, and other social characteristics, whether that's age, class, sexuality, interact with each other to produce forms of oppression and discrimination. Um, and as I'll touch on briefly later, also forms of privilege. Um, so we're drawing on the work of, of Crenshaw and others, looking at the experience of double discrimination among black women in the US, but also much longer histories of intersectional thinking, perhaps not using the term, but certainly using that way of thinking through how uh, these vulnerabilities interact that um, is prevalent in the global south, um, you know, from the bottom up. Um, so there's actually a paper... Um, which you can again find the reference in the policy report, written by Tanya, Kavita, Nicola, Katja and myself, thinking through some of those longer histories of intersectional thinking to frame how we, how we address that in the project. Okay. So um, to talk to that theme specifically to start with, um, I'm not going to say too much about Haiti because we have Tony coming up, um, but certainly the experience of Haitian migrants moving to Brazil, um, the issues that they face in terms of xenophobia um, and uh, discrimination are shaped by 
the linguistic and cultural differences that they experience, but also very much informed by you know, um, the legacy of racial hierarchies associated with slave plantation societies. Um, I'm going to let Tony expand on that thinking uh, much more in her own presentation. Um, but you know, that was kind of one of the areas that we really, you know, it spoke very dramatically, I think, to this theme. But similarly, say in Nepal, um, we're looking at the, the ways in which social norms stigmatize women migrants and the paternalistic legal restrictions to women's mobility framed in Nepal in relation to a you know, ban on domestic work in the Gulf, but that um, largely applies to women, even if it's not uh, specifically targeted in law at women. Um, and these issues of social stigma, the perceptions of impurity, undermine the ways in which migrant women, um, the, the choices that they're able to make, and also the, um, their experiences when they return to Nepal. Um, but again, it's not enough just to, to sort of categorize Nepali migrant women in one group. That experience of discrimination and those attitudes vary considerably by ethnic group. So you need to take the ethnicity of uh, the, the migrant women into account when understanding the experiences at origin and also at destination. Um, and also, uh, sometimes, you know, these framings can be too focused only on vulnerability and not reflecting enough the agency of migrant women so it's important to also talk to the way in which migrant women in Malaysia the Nepali migrant women that our Malaysian team was talking to you know they often reflected quite positively on how they were challenging um, the, uh, the these gendered stereotypes you know particularly around masculine breadwinning so there was an uh, you know there was an opportunity also to challenge albeit with some structural problems built in um, these these stereotypes so um, I think that sense of mixed experiences also informs the overall outcomes that we were finding within the project uh, when we were exploring issues around empowerment but also vulnerability um, of women and whether or not they benefit from that experience over the course of their migration experiences. So um, um, one thing that was characteristic of all these migration flows is that they were largely male-dominated migration flows. Women were migrating in smaller numbers, which is not always true, for example, for south-north flows, where there may be areas where women are actually in the, you know, the overwhelming majority. In the countries that we were exploring, they're a, they're a small minority. And actually, in that kind of context, um, it makes it easier for migrant men, whether at origin or at destination, to exert greater um, social control over the experiences of migrant women. So it's a particular challenge for women when they're in a minority uh, to assert their own kind of agency and um, to sort of maximize their, um, the benefits that they're getting out of, uh, of their migration uh, journey. Um, and this is exacerbated by, for example, temporary labor uh, migration regimes in Asia, um, which, I mean, they, they impact on the on the choices of migrant men as well as migrant women. Um, but within that already constrained environment, they really restrict the choices that migrant women especially face when um, deciding about their social and economic futures, both at the origin country, but also, sorry, both at the destination country, but also upon return. Um, and thinking not only about the migrants, but the families of migrants. Um, so the team working in China um, who were looking at the um, issues faced by the family members who stay back um, really found, again, this kind of mixed ambivalent finding wherein um, the wives of miners, so these, these were um, mostly mining communities going to uh, Ghana to, to, to do mining, the wives of miners who stay back spoke about the economic empowerment, having more control over the use of household budgets and, and these kinds of decisions, but also how that wasn't just a good thing because they were taking over traditionally male domains and that came with a workload and a set of responsibilities that was simply added on top of their existing uh, gendered uh, roles you know, in relation to the family, um, whether that's to children or to other um, family members. So they, they were speaking you know, very directly about this double burden um, where you, know, you might have empowerment sitting alongside really um, uh, oppressive uh, time constraints uh, and, uh, that, w that women were facing. Okay. Um, so a theme for us throughout the project was to explore um, the 
gendered nature of social networks. I mean, all migration um, experiences are underpinned by social networks um, that often determine the choice of destination. They structure the opportunities and the outcomes. And really, um, you know, those are always gendered in nature. Um, examples that, you know, we, we've come across through the project is both the, say, role of um, social networks origin for Chinese miners, mostly male miners migrating to, to Ghana. Um, but then also, and I'm not going to speak to this in detail, but um, really interesting ways in which networks at destination, including networks of emotion, you know, emotion and sexual relationships with Ghanaians, structure um, uh, the ways in which Chinese uh, migrants are able to undertake business activities, whether it's in the mining sector or more broadly. Um, and um, although relationships between Chinese women and Ghanaian men were fewer, they exist, and they have a different set of characteristics to the kind of opposite uh, way around. Um, for Nepali women, um, prior to migration, there's much more limited networks. They find information harder to access, and that, again, shapes the kind of choice of destination and their opportunities. But also at destination, it has particular consequences. So if your social networks in Malaysia are, uh, are more limited, it's much harder to change employer because very often people change employer through connections with friends or with family members who might find them another job, and I'm going to move on quite quickly. <laughs> Sorry, there we go. Um, so um, I'm going to have to speak quite quickly to these slides, but one of the concerns that we, has come out of the project really is a, an interest in non-traditional employment sectors. Broadly speaking, um, gendered research on migration and, uh, and also specifically on migrant women speaks often very directly to the care uh, sectors, the domestic work sectors, um, but actually women are working in a lot of different uh, non-traditional areas, whether that's uh, industry, so the example is uh, Malaysia, where Nepali women are mostly working in factories um, and face very specific risks um, in terms of wage deduction, but also restrictions to mobility because they're often living in dormitory accommodation. Nepali men at the same time um, have... Uh, their own set of gendered risks. They're often uh, employed to handle raw materials rather than um, end products, and actually that has very harsh working conditions. So these risks are gendered. It, they, they apply to men as well as to women, but obviously. Um, and um, if we're talking about Ghana, for example, then we need to think through the role of Chinese women in mining, which is not a sector that's been explored very much. Um, and that includes in, say, leadership roles. So you do have some Chinese women taking a stronger role um, in mining concessions, um, and this is talking to the issue, again, I'll leave Mary to explore this in more detail, but the kind of intersections of privilege as well as vulnerability. Okay. So in terms of gender and global migration governance, you know, we were finding that um, global policy has lagged behind this sectoral diversity among my female uh, migration flows in the global south. Um, and there's a lot of variation at a, a regional and national level in terms of how gender responsive policies um, to migration are embedded in, um, uh, in, in, in regional and national policies. Um, we spoke about ASEAN in earlier sessions. There you might have a regional policy agenda that's reasonably vibrant in terms of the discussions taking place within ASEAN. But when you then look at national or bilateral uh, agreements, um, they're often gender blind or in the case of Nepal and Malaysia, even gender restrictive. Um, and um, in some cases, there's just a complete failure to address really gendered issues in policies concerning, say, migration from Africa or Asia to Gulf countries, where you know, there's almost no policies um, ar around this in most of the main policy fora. Right. So you can find more on the specific policy recommendations in the, in the document. Um, Broadly speaking, we, we can see the value of an intersectional approach to understanding gender inequalities when we're looking across all of these different corridors, and we would argue that that's a really important framing concept to bring into migration research, but also migration policy. Um, governments need to um, focus more on, on labor market and social integration for migrant women and men, um, especially improved access for migrant women to information training at origin and destination. They need to pay attention to the double burden faced by migrant women, but also often uh, their family members who stay back. And, you know, really pay attention to the paternalistic, gender-restrictive policies that still exist at national and bilateral levels that curtail women's freedom to migrate and make their own employment decisions. And this is my last slide. <laughs> and for international organizations, 
CSOs, researchers, a lot of the people in the room today, um, really uh, trying to make sure that the gender responsive approach that is built into the global compact and is often, you know, appears in, in the language uh, that uh, frames global policy really is reflected in national, regional and interregional policies in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Um, and I think that that involves um, not only that top-down agenda, but also very much a bottom-up agenda which engages with feminist movements, migrants' rights organizations, trade unions, and other kind of key partners, um, and also engages with that broader whole-of-society approach to address gender discrimination, racial bias in society more broadly. And I will bring my remarks to a close. Thank you very much, Matt, and those um, recommendations at the end. Just a few small things is what I would say. This is uh, where we get into the discussion about, uh, you know, uh, the long-term systemic um, areas of bias and discrimination and how we can try and move the ship around. And it's a big task, but um, you're quite right in terms of pointing to governments, but also to international organisations, civil society, especially in terms of implementing um, the priorities of the Global Compact. Most, it's a very strong area of focus. It hasn't been, as you know, as we all know, it hasn't been um, an area that has had uh, due regard, if I can put it that way, um, in the past, but uh, certainly the Gender Plus Migration Hub and other colleagues uh, in the network have certainly taken that on, so we've got a, a stronger gender focus in uh, the delivery and the implementation of the Global Compact for Safe Orderly Regular Migration going forward. I have a confession to make already to my panellists. Um, I didn't stick to this sort of <laughs> the minutes I allowed Matt to speak a little bit longer, so I will also do the same for you. I am timing and I will do the little thing, but 10 minutes and then we'll go into the three minutes sort of countdown. So Tony, it's over to you now. And you've got a little bit longer to speak. Here you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to our host for bringing us together to discuss these issues across fields, you know, across institutions, between policymakers, researchers, and civil society organizations. And I want to thank Matt for that overview of the research that has been done on gender inequalities and migration. And so my presentation is going to focus on the case of uh, Haitians mig migrating through the Latin American region. Um, so in the MIDEC Haiti study consisted of a mixed mes methodology uh, in which we did a household survey that had about 949 uh, participants surveyed across five of the 10 uh, administrative regions. It also included social network tracing, focus groups, and in-depth interviews, as well as field observations. So some of the themes that we explored in our research was, was included forms of inequalities faced during decision making, uh, during the migration to uh, different countries and at destination. We also explored gender differentials in migration as well as impacts of migration processes and structural constraints on Haitian women in the homeland. So one of the things we wanted to understand was how do gender relations influence migration flows from Haiti to Latin America? And what, some of the results that we found is that the decision to migrate generally is made by men in the family, uh, a spouse, a husband, uncles or brothers in Haiti, or they may actually be abroad. Um, and when they're abroad, they may participate in decision making as well as financing the migratory process itself. Um, men were privileged as the first to migrate, and if multiple people migrated in the household, they may be the second, third, if not fourth, to migrate as well. Um, and men were perceived as having more stamina um, that was needed to either engage in, a, in an arduous labor market abroad or the stamina necessary to undertake migration trails in um, very difficult routes across several different countries um, with an irregular status. Men were also perceived to have intellectual capabilities that women didn't have that would allow them to navigate the process of migrating, either without the proper documentation, as well as navigating challenges that they may encounter um, while trying to integrate at destination or the challenges that they may encounter in transit. When we look at Haitian women in um, particular, uh, they typically migrated as part of the my, uh, re family reunification schemes. However, we should point out that within the last seven years, migration by women autonomously has been on the rise consistently. 
Uh, and one of the final points that we found from the study, the survey in particular, was that perceptions about migration along lines of gender were pretty consistent. Uh, women migrating to reunite with family were viewed positively, while those migrating autonomously are, were viewed with disdain by both male and female heads of households that participated in our survey. So what we wanted to underlie the fact that the values that undergird you know, these social hierarchies, these gender biases, are also shared by women uh, in the household. So Matt talked about taking an intersectional approach to understanding gender inequalities and migration. And what we found is that it is absolutely critical when thinking about the experiences of Haitians migrating in Latin America to take this approach um, for several reasons. Haitian men and women carry the stigma of blackness. And this is an important thing to note because they're migrating into Latin America where many of the countries have a history of mi uh, migration policies that uh, targeted European, mi um, Europeans as, uh, mi to migrate to their countries, and in some cases, East Asians. Um, so this black body entering into this space, this mestizo space, or this uh, mixed race space, or your very European spaces, has caused a you know a problem for a lot of countries that never had to deal and manage black bodies, and have actually put a lot of effort into making sure that that body wasn't represented in the body politic. Um, so when we think of things like uh, blanqueamiento or eclara la, la raza, you know, lightening the race. These fundamentally undergird the, the policies that have existed over decades um, in many of these countries. And so we have to understand that Haitians coming into Latin America over the past decade or so has created some significant um, problems and called into question the identities of uh, you know, host na the host nation itself. Um, and it, with these black bodies come the assumptions regarding social status. They're poor or of low socioeconomic status, have limited ed education, or the quality of their education may be called into question, question when they have high educational attainment. They encounter racial biases that relegate them to low-skilled, uh, labor-intensive jobs that the lo local population often rejects. And they must contend with other negative stereotypes regarding their culture, that they lack a culture, they have a degenerate culture, or just the stigma associated with traditional religions such as voodoo. Now, Haitian women in particular face gender biases, which I discussed earlier about their subordinate status to men, uh, their physical, intellectual, and emotional weakness. And they're also confronted with racially based stereotypes regarding piety and virtue. And I think Matt just mentioned this when he talked about Nepali women and impurity. Um, and so this lends itself to the sexual harassment, exploitation, and abuse of these black female bodies as bodies that can be violated or that may be sexually, uh, you know, se over sexualized. So in many ways, they are objectified, and also they're, because their rights aren't necessarily respected, they are subjected to a lot of um, abuse. But we also need to not just I, talk about intersectionality, intersectionality, we must consider it in context. So regional geopolitics of, and migrating Haitians in Latin America are confronted with a number of issues that also impact their experience beyond just their, you know, their identities, whether identity observed or imposed on them. Um, they, there's a migrant crisis in North America at the U.S.-Mexico border that mainly focuses on Latinx migrants coming from Central and South America. However, within that population migrating across South and Central America, you have Haitians, you have West Africans, Central Africans, you even have Asians that are part of this uh, group of people who are migrating um, across this uh, treacherous route. There are more Venezuelans on the move in the region, making Haitians a numeric minority, so sometimes they're obscured from discussions about what is happening on this trail. Throughout Latin America, migrant serving or organizations largely serve this population, not only because they're a new, you know, numerically a larger population, but policies have been developed to help them integrate 
um, into different Latin American countries. And funding has been earmarked for these purposes. And with these policies comes a clear route of intervention for migrant servant organizations that they may not have uh, when it comes to serving Haitians in terms of how they can actually help them integrate and what their needs are. Haitians on the move also face linguistic challenges, which Matt also uh, raised. Although that is not the case for all, we have to point out that some of the Haitians are also circulating with Latin America and may have lived in Brazil and or Chile or Ecuador for one to two to three to four years before deciding to onward migrate north um, towards the U.S.-Mexico border. And then they also face challenges accessing justice and services because of linguistic barriers that those who have not necessarily lived in another Spanish-speaking country uh, would, uh, would uh, not be, so they are unable to facilitate and access these services. And the migrant serving organizations are unable to provide those services because they don't necessarily have the linguistic capacity um, to assist them. There are also cultural differences, which we talked about, xenophobia, that exacerbate the challenges they face in Latin America. But we also have to point to anti-Haitianism, which is a distinct form of xenophobia that is targeted towards Haitians themselves. And it's rooted in the history of the region, you know, Haiti emerging as the first independent black republic, and all in a, in a, in a time where they were isolated uh, geopolitically, and that other nations' independence was mitigated on, based on not us accepting or not abolishing slavery within their own within their own borders. So a lot of countries have risen kind of in this opposition to the Haitian identity, which is kind of Afri Africa linked um, and has very, been very complicated um, in this region. So the ha anti Haitianism is very distinct from the xenophobia that is faced by other populations in the region. So we also wanted to talk about Haitian women and how the migration process reproduces social hierarchies that reinforce their subordinate status. As I mentioned before, men are decision makers and they determine who will migrate um, and they facilitate that migration. So if you're migrating under the family reunification scheme, you have a spouse that is in another country that is pretty much organizing all the documentation, paying for the airfare, and doing everything on behalf of the woman. So women tend to not be as informed about the process of, or how they actually were able to reunite with their families. Haitian males also have higher rates of formal labor market integration and higher wages in both Haiti and abroad than their female counterparts, which also reinforces social hierarchies. And Haitian women's workplaces when at destination are often gendered. So they're relegated to restaurant work and care work in Latin America. However, it's important to note that opportunities afforded to Haitian women are also, you know, particularly in the service industry, are limited by racism. So they're usually excluded from forward-facing public um, positions, you know, and relegated to back rooms or the kitchens where they are, can be invisible, uh, for lack of a better term. And one last point I wanted to bring up regarding the data was there were some really um, large sub silences in the data um, where female heads of households were unable to provide information about the, uh, you know, about the migratory process, the costs, the challenges that were faced in transit, the challenges that were faced in, um, at destination. And this kind of illuminates the extent to which women's uh, marginalization and, and decision-making processes and limited understanding it isn't just because they are dependent, because we're also talking about female heads of households not having sufficient um, information. And that shows you the extent to which men are really making the decisions uh, that, you know, that revolve around the migratory process. So in conclusion, um, gender and migration focused policy prescriptions must account for similarities and differences in the opportunities and challenges faced by the targeted population. Um, you know, we tend to take a deficit approach to understanding migration, but we do need to also account for some of the opportunities that migration, you know, avails to, you know, to uh, the, those who are on the move. We need more rigorous research to understand the persistent legacy of racial inequality that limits the opportunities and development of Afro-descendant populations in this particular region, as well as in other regions, you know, this is applicable. 
of future research on themes related to gender migration and race in Latin America must account for both privilege and vulnerability found within and among migrating po uh, populations. Just as policies, you know, can help assist certain population, it may disadvantage other populations that are also in those same countries or in those same regions that are on the move. And we sound, finally, I think it's important to point out that sound migration policy making aimed at reducing inequalities in host countries can also serve as a reference point for the development of policies that reduce inequalities in the origin country. And I think that speaks a lot to the work that um, OEC has, OEC, OECD has been doing on migration and development, because what we find is that the same issues and challenges that people face at home, you know, and I think uh, Hearns mentioned this, the path dependency that follows them throughout the migratory process, you know, uh, also follows them through to the host country. And so when we're dealing with reducing inequalities in the host institution, we also need to dig deeper so that we understand how the vulner their vulnerabilities at home contributed to their vulnerability in host institutions. And so it's also an opportunity for us to think about how what our work does to reduce inequalities can speak to the work of policymakers in origin countries. And I hope I didn't take up too much time. Thank you. And honestly, it's not all about the timing, is it? But that was perfect. Thank you, Tony, very much. Um, we will now turn uh, to Mary. She will take us through um, her research, particularly in regards to Ghana. We'll just wait for the PowerPoint slide to come up. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is, and this is kind of like a question for all panelists for when we get to the sort of like this, the first round of questions and so forth, is very interested to hear about um, how migrants themselves during these journeys and processes, even regards to decision making, financial inclusion, um, dealing with uh, the intersectional issues around discrimination and, and racism and so forth, how they are supporting each other through those sort of processes. That, and I'm sure that's come up in the research. I'm, I'm, I have no doubt about that. But I'd be really interested in the different corridors, what your experiences from the research findings um, have brought uh, to light on that particular issue. Now, Mary, sorry, you've got your PowerPoint slide up. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to you. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, I think a lot of thanks have gone ahead, and so I'm, I'm just stepping on existing protocols to say thank you to all the different stakeholders involved. And so I'm talking about gender inequalities and migration along um, the China-Ghana corridor, and uh, my case is a bit different from the Haiti experience. We looked at Ghana as a destination for Chinese. Um, and we also looked at return migrants from China, but most of our focus was also looking at Ghana as a destination. So it gives it a different and perhaps an interesting perspective within the study of migration and the South-South migration um, project. Okay. It's, oh, okay. <laughs> so how do I go out? I thought I had learned enough. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Yeah, so the data, just like the Haiti experience, we also use mixed methods, and we, we had about 1,268 um, Chinese migrants in Ghana that we interviewed during the survey. We also had some in-depth interviews with Chinese, with return migrants, with key informants, and focus group discussions with communities. We had life histories with some Chinese and Ghanaians, and so these are... Um, triangulation of different methods, trying to arrive at the issues of migration and gender in this particular context. So for this particular um, discussion, I'm looking at the gender inequalities. And so there are about three themes I'll be talking about. So let me start with the first one. The first theme that comes up is gender inequalities, resistance, and migration decision. So what do I mean by that? We notice that, so from the literature, you see, or even from policy circles, you realize that Chinese, I mean, everybody talks about Chinese in Africa, but there hasn't been massive study except what we have done with um, the MIDEC project. And also looking at the Ghana-China corridor, we saw a lot of presence of Chinese, but it had a stigma, it had negative connotation, they are destroying our environment, but not paying attention and 
putting all of them in a box as a homogeneous group, but there are differences. And so we try to look at the gender issues within that corridor. So yes, the, the males are dominating in terms of the flows to Ghana, but there are also a few females we found in our study. And major, um, when it comes to decision making, we found that yes, just as other migration corridors have, um, and I think what um, Haiti has um, revealed, Coming to Ghana was not just a straight jacket. There were some resistance. So some female Chinese migrants said they were, I mean, from the study, they were opposed by their mothers, especially. And then the reasons were that is too far. Ghana is too far. The linguistics challenges, insecurity in Ghana, inexperiences of the migrants, weather conditions. These were experiences, uh, the reasons that we were, they were given for not uh, for they not being able to travel to Ghana, but eventually they still made their way out. And for Chinese males, especially husbands, they had opposition or resistance from their partners because they felt it's too far and may, they may be ignoring their families once they get to Ghana. And some female Ghanaian returnees, also we asked them about the reasons and it, it was indifferent. And so some of them had to take the unilateral decision and sometimes inform their families after they had arrived. And some of the reasons they gave were that their families fear that they will be scammed, maybe they will be um, duped on the way, or perhaps when they get to China, they will not have better experiences. And the fact that culturally and ideologically, China is also not a prestigious place when we come to major destination countries for Ghana. And the other thematic area that also comes up strongly is gender inequalities in intersections in the labor market, which Matt also explained a bit, and so I, I hope to highlight more. So beyond the usual care work that we all know, the study also, we found that some female Chinese migrants were into other sectors. So they were in the mining sector. We have the famous Aisha Wan. If some people have been following the Ghanaian news, the famous woman who had lots of concessions and controlled a lot of political power in the mining sector. And, but again, there were also some in different people were acting, some of the Chinese females were acting as language translators. They were entrepreneurs in different businesses. They were into the educational sector. And all these things were based on your network, the, your income, and the class that you belong to. Again, not only that, but the Ghanaian women who also find themselves in this space also have some advantages. There was also a privilege of owning their own companies because of the association within the Chinese group. We also find that Ghanaian women working in some Chinese companies have no social protection. Most of them were employed as casual workers, no maternity leave, no sick leave, nothing. And so they were just working, um, sometimes even paid below um, $1 a day. The Chinese men usually occupy managerial positions when it comes to employment. And so some of the studies we did, especially in the mining sectors, also we found that they were in, Chinese men were in managerial positions. They, they did the less risky jobs compared to Ghanaians. Ghanaians were the ones going underground, going to where the mining sites were, doing the riskier jobs. Again, the mills also collect the sand. For instance, in the mining sector, they collect the sand, and which also has some health implications on their, uh, on their lives. And here, the inequalities are created based, are created by income. We notice that yet the Chinese has income. So there is some priority or privileges. There are some privileges are tied to the Chinese in Ghana. They have the income and also based on where they are coming from, China, and the class. And that also helps them to access the labor market more than even what an ordinary Ghanaian will be able to um, enter into. The last theme I want to talk about is gender inequalities and migration opportunities and outcomes. And so here we find that female Chinese migrants were discriminated against by their, Chinese, their own Chinese counterparts when they were married to Ghanaian men. And so they would prefer that they marry Indian, Lebanese, who are of Ghanaian origin, than to marry Ghanaians who are of Ghanaian origin. But some female Chinese migrants defile these, this, despite the complaints, to marry Ghanaian men. And so some of those we spoke to, they gain economic advantage. Female Chinese immigrants gain economic advantage. They have residential rights. They have citizenship rights because of that marital relationship found between them and Ghanaian men. Some female Ghanaians 
have also taken advantage of that relationship. So when it comes to the men marrying Ghanaian women, that wasn't a problem. It wasn't a stigma. And so some women in such, some Ghanaian women in such relationships also become entrepreneurs. Sometimes they have access to the mining sector. They have their own companies, their concessions, because the law allows them to do that. Chinese females married to Chinese males, they also encounter challenges when it comes to reconciling their domestic responsibilities with the demands of their new environment. And so gender roles are not shared. If, if you compare it to Chinese men marrying Ghanaian women, those in those settings, the gender roles, the reproductive roles are shared. But when it comes to Chinese Chinese um, marriage, there was no shared responsibility. The woman still carries on her reproductive roles plus her productive roles. Ghanaian females married to Chinese husbands, they fear rejection. And so if you look at um, the existing literature, yes, marriages of such are not encouraged in China. And so they are married for several years. The woman might have not even visited China. And so when you ask them about the future of that relationship, they fear about the future because they are not sure if they'll be accepted one day when they find themselves in China. And Although infrequent, we sometimes um, recorded xenophobic, xenophobic attacks due to the race or nationality or sometimes a negative perceptions concerning Chinese involvement, especially in the mining sector. And so these are the main thematic areas, but the gender and my, what's the gender and migration policy gaps in Ghana and China? And so generally, migration policies and labor migration policies are gender blind. So we have national migration policy, we have labor migration policy, we even have diaspora policy, but they are all gender blind. Or they are neutral. Nobody talks about the differences and the, the impact outcomes. So in a few cases where women are even mentioned, they are seen as victims of migration without recognizing their positive impacts. And this is very important for us to note. Again, there is less attention on gender inequality qualities generally, particularly even when it comes to female Chinese migrants, they have, there's a lot of negative attention to that, especially because of the Aisha one case. And so nobody wants to talk about it. Anytime we talk about it, it's associated with negativity, um, irregular means of um, manipulating the system. So since these, but we can't ignore it because the data shows that there's increasing flows of Chinese into Ghana. And Ghana is becoming one of the key destinations for China. And so because of that, we need to do some, we need to engage in policy discourse to see how best to enhance the benefits, as was said earlier, to enhance the benefits of migration, reducing the challenges. So here, some of the recommendations are generally for all of us, and especially to the Ghanaian community, and to most African countries where we are receiving more Chinese into the system. We need to be intentional about our approach. We need to center the voices of female male migrants in a gender um, responsive policies, but particularly in our case, the Ghanaians are also important. The non-migrants are also important in this case. We need to collect quality data, which my colleagues have already said. And with that quality data, both quantitative and qualitative, we need to have a gender-specific focus in um, to uncover the differences and inequalities between men and women. And understanding the jobs, it helps us by studying that we understand the jobs and men and women migrants are engaging, we understand the conditions. So at least the MyDeck project helps us to understand some of the conditions in some of the Chinese companies. Access to information is limited, no support services. And so we need to, once we have known this, we need to do more consistently, enhance supervision to be able to know that. Yeah, I want to go out. Sorry, I skipped one slide. Oh, I missed it. Okay. So the other part is also um, following what Matt gave earlier. Now to social, social partners like IOM, ILO, you are all in the corridors. And so you know what, um, this is to let you know what is happening. But what can you do to help? To provide technical capacity on how to mainstream gender into migration policies and labor migration policies, which Ghana have. So what they have been doing, so IOM has been supporting Ghana to mainstream migration into development, but not gender. So that is something that we can put across. And then also mobilize the whole of government approach, all society approach, all of them together for, from the local level, national level to put pressure on government to also promote gender responsive labor migration policies, either based on the SDGs, the gender responsive approaches to the GCM or the AU, 
MPFA, the Migration Policy Framework, which AU has, the ECOWAS protocol, they all have gender issues in there. But we need some enforcement. I think in the morning, the keynote highlighted that enforcement is weak. And so this is something that we can help to do that. But again, generally, there isn't so much CSOs in the system, especially in Ghana, promoting the activities of um, female migrants. And this is an area that we can enter into. And then governments. For, so we need the China-Ghana corridor government to negotiate particularly from an, a destination point of view, I'm talking about Ghana, Ghana needs to negotiate with Chinese government to develop gender responsive bilateral labor agreements following the AU guidelines so that both the migrants and both the, both the, the destination and the home, we all benefit from it. So, so far they are coming, but there is, so China has a policy that promotes their migrant, their, their citizens to come to Ghana for investment, but there isn't any bilateral agreement in that sector. And then we need to develop gender responsive migration policy, taking into account protection, language, and integration of both male and female migrants and their children. So remember that in all these marital relationships are children and they haven't been factored in the discussions at all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, and as you were talking, I was thinking uh, again of the, the issues around gender identity. And I'm going to anticipate another question, probably it's already in the online chat, for all of the panelists in terms of just reflecting on your experiences in terms of some of the sensitivities, some of the challenges in dealing with gender identity beyond just sex disaggregation, whether that's data collection, quantitative, qualitative, you know, your mixed methods approach and so forth. So I will leave that one uh, to the Q&A session. We will uh, now turn to Ambassador Yvette Stevens. Thank you so much again for joining us, um, Yvette. Uh, the floor is yours and then we'll be able to get into the q &A. Over to you, thanks. Well, um, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me um, to this um, event today. I must say I'll be speaking, looking at the whole issue of migration from a human rights perspective. And I, because I think even though we talk about human rights when it comes to migration, in terms of how we handle it from all the human rights instruments that we have at our disposal, that is not also always clear. I want to look particularly the case of female migrant domestic workers in the Middle Eastern countries, mainly coming from West Africa. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to listen to, to hear some of the testimonies that have been given lately and covered by international press too about the way these female migrants who go to the Middle East, the problems that they have to face. Um, first of all, I think we have to look at two groups of these migrants. Some of them are women who are trafficked because let us face it, I mean, somebody was saying to the migrants are not the poorest, but in this particular case, these are the poorest people. They see an opportunity to go to and get income and income for their families, and they jump at it. I mean, the traffickers come, and um, they promise to take them to the US, to Europe, and they find themselves ending in some Middle Eastern country. So but those are those who are trafficked, but there are also those who are recruited by brokers, some of the brokers within the countries themselves. And um, they, are, they are enticed. Of course, they didn't take much in terms of enticing them, as I said, because these are very poor women, and they want to go and earn some money for their families. So again, let us look at what is happening. If you listen to some of the stories, it goes beyond just discrimination. It goes, be, it goes up to violent um, um, human rights violations, atrocities against these workers. And many of the stories which we have seen um, in published worldwide, in fact, it's no secret anymore, that many of these um, women who go to the Middle East find themselves, first of all, the moment they arrive, their passports are taken from them, they are taken to um, some recruitment center. The recruitment um, agency has a center where they go in and um, they are kept there. And believe it or not, they are advertised on social media, something which is reminiscent of the slave trade. Because if you look at some of what is put in terms of selling these migrants to 
prospective families is that they distinguish them by race, by age, by status. And they come out as advertisement. And as I said, this is reminiscent of the, the slave trade, trading slaves. So I, I, what I'm saying is that it goes beyond just um, discrimination against female workers in the Middle East. It goes within violation of their human rights. And also, it tantamounts to a modern form of slavery. And we should say, how is it? Because we, there are human rights mechanisms that should be able to deal with situations like this. But in fact, when I look, and I did some looking into what, what does it, what relates to um, this case, particular case, in terms of the many human rights treaties and, um, and, and, and conventions, covenants that are available, and many of them, there are 18 main core human rights um, 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 confidence, co conventions, or other um, instruments. And when you look at them, you know, you look at the ones that particularly um, relate to these women that I'm talking about, and you'll find that most, most of the major, the core human rights treaties are being violated in regard to these women. But then you see what are the what are the steps which could be taken? How could this be addressed within the human rights context? And this is where you find that there is something lacking. Because first of all, if you look at all these human rights treaties, many of these countries I'm talking about, they have not, of the 18 treaties, the Gulf countries, many of them have not, in fact, all of them, none of them, have, have ratified more than nine of those treaties. And the thing is, this is a way of not having to account, because once you haven't ratified a treaty, you don't have to face the committee that is looking at the um, 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 implementation of that treaty. So that way, you, you do not, you miss the, the, the whole, you're, you're not accountable to anybody for some of this. But then you would say, because I think something which is always placed for the Human Rights Council is the universal periodic review. Every single country in the world faces the U Human Rights Council to review their human rights records. Now, if, when, I, I, when I look through some of the recommendations which went to these countries, um, destination I, I, I'm talking about in those countries, is that the recommendations which go to them are rather vague. And I tell you something I know because I, I was in the Human Rights Council, um, <laughs> there's a, a sort of campaign to damp in recommendations and in, in areas which are sensitive. So um, if I, sitting here, wanted to make a strong recommendation about the treatment of migrants to a given country I won't name, I would get a call from the ambassador to say, you better damp in it. And then it comes out as, continue your efforts to improve the, the, the human rights of migrants. Continue your efforts. How do you follow up on that? And of course, they come back, yes, we agree, we'll continue our efforts. But what is the real result on the ground? These women continue to face these situations. It is, it, you, we cannot stop them from going because even at the country of origin, if you say to these women, no, you can't go, you know, the imperatives that they face, I know that in my country, Sierra Leone, once, once when there was an incident, I think it was in one of the countries, and the government was saying that women cannot travel to those countries. They found a way to go to Guinea and around so they could go, get there. So they are going to go there. But when they go there, you hear all what they feel. I mean, it is it, the, the, the stories that you hear, you know, would make very disturbing reading. I mean, women who are, if, if you, if you, if you um, leave the, 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 the house where you have been placed, you are beaten by the recruitment a um, 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 agency, you are beaten, physically beaten, you are, you, you are locked up, you can't, so many times we have seen, I think one, one occasion, I think from Sayalin and some Carter, who had come, had a way, had a means, somebody had a phone and they called somebody and they, they tried to get them out of the situation. And so again, I'm saying that we need to look at human rights aspects going beyond discrimination. And we need to look at particular extreme situations like the one I'm talking about because these women 
are going to go to these countries. They're going to suffer all the humiliation and, um, and, and, the, and, and violations of their human rights. They're going to suffer in peace. They're going to walk, sit there because they want to have little money and they want to send their little money for their families. And this is important, but I think we should be vigilant that when such situations are brought out, that the required research into these situations is taken and required action. I mean, so because just leaving this to say, okay, this is another story of someone, why are you going there in the first place? It's not going to respond to the question. So I think this is something which we need to, I mean, pay, pay great attention to. Also looking within, because quite apart from the human rights treaties, and, and they're also um, tied, I mean, countries are bound, even if they haven't signed any treaty, all countries in the world are bound to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So they could be held under that, even if they do not be, they did not ratify any other treaty. So I think more needs to be done to see how these, these, um, these situations could be brought under the human rights umbrella and dealt with as any other violations of human rights are being dealt with. I mean, I have served um, as chair rapporteur to the Human Rights Council once on the prevention of human rights violations. And I tell you, these are some of the things that I, I thought need to be brought out. And for those who are in a position to do so, to delve deeply into these questions and to find some solutions. I mean, to hold, I mean, I think there's some bias to my interpretation is that because these countries are used to having people, black Africans, as slaves in the past, they do not see that at this point of time, these people are no longer slaves and they should be not be treated still as slaves. So basically to conclude, I would just want to say if what I would recommend in terms of um, um, another point before that, there's also inequalities found out that <laughs> of the women who are going to these Middle Eastern countries, the salaries that are given to them differ. The Africans get the least. And um, those coming from the Philippines, etc., get much more. So there is discrimination, even within this whole um, 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 scenery that we are looking at. Um, I, think, I think, first of all, what I would like to say by way of conclusions is that the need for the Human Rights Council to take matter in hand. Blatant abuses of most human rights treaties and instances of modern slavery should not go unnoticed, and there has to be some degree of accountability, both from the countries of origin, I tell you that because, I'll tell you why also, and for the countries of destination. Because I believe that the countries of origin, they know about this, and they could do a lot more. They could do a lot more by getting into bilateral ag agreements with these countries on the treatment of women who are going there as female do domestic workers. They protest, but I think they could do much more in terms of promoting, because of this need to have um, 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 greater, greater uh, um, control of what is happening. Of course, the countries of this destination, they need to be held accountable under all the, under for the systematic abuses um, as documented from the various testimonies. Um, then I think also there's a need, there of course there's a need for more research to collect real time data on the state and situation of female dom domestic workers in the Middle East, in the Middle Eastern countries. And also um, before I end, and mentioned accountability. <laughs> and there's a need also to get the data and document because there's nowhere you could get data on how many of these female workers are in these countries. Um, there's a need, there's a real debt of information on that. And that is really, if one has to act, one needs to know that. But my plea here, and I hope um, it is heard, is that for the researchers to pay greater attention to specific situations where it comes out that it's not just the discrimination that we're talking about. When it goes further than just discrimination, it goes into abuses, human rights abuses, violation of rights, slavery. I think that needs to be banned particular attention. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Yvette, Ambassador Stevens. It was an impassioned sort of plea, and certainly, as we heard earlier, 
from a position of being liberated from the encumbrances of an official position. So <laughs> we're delighted that you would be able to share uh, your insights from your long and rich um, experience and professional positions over a long period of time. It's always good to start with human rights. Um, that is something that is right the way across this policy symposium. We heard it this morning in, at every turn, actually, that human rights is the core. And this is why we're sitting, actually, in the UN Palais, because it is so um, focused on human rights. Migration is intertwined with human rights. It's right the way through the entire migration cycle, um, of course. And gender is really very much about human rights of uh, migrants right the way through the entire system. I have written down so many times, power asymmetries, power asymmetries, power asymmetries. And we heard it from Yvette in terms of the highest levels. You know, we're talking about the power asymmetries between states. But we have also heard it um, across every single presentation, including this morning, in terms of within states, uh, within groups of people um, who are migrating uh, communities who are not migrating, um, households and so forth. So power asymmetries comes very, very much uh, to the fore. And I think the plea is really for researchers to shine the light on some of those perverse outcomes and how human rights has often been neglected and how it is intertwined with power asymmetries. So I'm sure we'll get into a very interesting discussion. I did note that you hit on one of the big policy conundrums, which is the protection of citizens via all sorts of different policy interventions, including bans on travel of migrant workers versus the impact on restricting agency, especially of women uh, migrant workers, which is something that, again, has come up this morning and again in our discussion. So I'm sure we'll get some very lively interventions and debate going. Um, uh, and I'm sure we'll probably hear from Jean on that. I just want to check that Jean, who is our discussant, is online. Yes, I am online now. Fantastic. Oh, that we can see you now. Thank you so much, Jean. Jean yes. is joining us from Cairo. Uh, Jean, thank you again for joining us. Uh, I'll give you the floor uh, now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mari, and thanks for having me as a discussant. Uh, a huge shout out and a huge applause to our panelists for their very insightful questions on the gendered structural dimensions of migration, including these power asymmetries within and between countries structured also around gender, on the gendered dynamics, the gendered impacts of women's migration for work, with very detailed evidence-based focus on a range of issues. Um, and some of these are as follows, the preponderance as our last speaker highlighted, on low-skilled women migrant workers in the informal segments of the care sector, particularly domestic work, where they face gross human rights violations, including being subjected to trafficking, uh, and the need to frame their issues and priorities within a gender-responsive human rights framework, the gender dynamics in the decisions to move, the gender dimensions of work on site, and very specifically, and this, this was very appealing, the way gender interfaces with other forms of marginalization, particularly racist constructs, whether it be or whether it structures employment or it structures violence or it structures sexuality and interpersonal relationships and marriage. And very rightly and very uh, strategically, uh, one of our speakers placed these racial dynamics within the regional geopolitics, so to speak. So building on these insights, uh, I have a few reflections to make. Number one, despite some commonalities on the gender dimensions of migration across geographies, there is really no substitute for rigorous, context-specific, root-based, corridor-based research on the, 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 dy the dynamics or the gender dimensions of women's migration for work that really teases out the nuanced, context-specific experience and priorities and brings to the fore new knowledge and new action, perhaps, or finessed action, culturally appropriate, context-specific action, so to speak. Secondly, it is important that we strive 
to recognize or ensure that domestic work is recognized across all countries and regions as work and that we strive for the rights protections of migrant and national domestic workers. But equally important, it is necessary to explore and to address women's migration for work at all tiers, low-skilled women's migration for work at the mid-skill levels and at the higher skill levels in the agricultural sector, in the manufacturing sector, and other segments of the service sector, as one of our speakers pointed out. Thirdly, it is critical and very important to look at the future of work for women migrant workers, national workers, in the context of global development trends, such as the fourth industrial revolution, the digital economy, the green economy, so to speak. And this entails an assessment of these broad global trends, the impacts that these trends have on women migrant workers, but also on national women workers, looking at the labor market demand for these different categories of women in these economic sectors at different tiers, and looking at the package of initiatives that are required in order to ensure that they have de facto access to decent work at all levels in this changing work fabric. Now, related to this, it's extremely important to have macro level labor market data for migrant workers and national workers by sector, by activity, by occupation, by skill level, by wage level, disaggregated by sex, disaggregated on the basis of nationality, age, migration status, at minimum, because this will give us the total picture of women's work, migrant women workers' work, as well as those of national women workers. It highlights women migrant workers' contribution to the economy and society. It can be used to debunk stereotypes of women migrant workers. And it also helps us to inform or to develop measures that ensure gender responsive labor migration governance that also looks at uh, you know how we match skills education training with labor market demand and with commensurate wages and with entitlements now here i want to say that un women has actually done a paper on the future of work for women migrant workers in the asia gulf corridor for the abu dhabi dialogue intergovernmental di process on migration we are also doing a paper on women's representation in the energy, the renewable energy sector in the UA and India, and expat women, so to speak, as they're called in the Gulf, you know, when it's higher skilled migrant workers, as well as low skilled migrant workers, they're called temporary migrant workers in Gulf states. So the position of these women in the renewable energy sector in the UAE, and we're happy to share this latter paper also when done. The fourth point or the fifth point I wish to make is that migration sits at the intersection, a very unique intersection of migration governance or my immigration regimes and labor market regimes and labor market governance. And it's very important that we look at and address the gender equality and women's rights dimensions across both these regimes, because rights violations at one stage impact the rights of women migrant workers at other stages. And in this context, I want to raise three issues. One, the need to review and to reform immigration laws, and some of this was raised in terms of restrictions on women's out migration, but also immigration laws, and to create and to enhance legal channels, more legal channels for women's migration, just as it is important to create more decent job options for women. Secondly, and in this context of this um, uh, migration sitting at the cusp of both these regimes, I want to say it's very important to look at the convergences and the differences between low-skilled women's migration for work, trafficking, and smuggling in terms of the structural drivers, the root causes of these issues, in terms of the dynamics, the impacts, but also in terms of the legal regimes that govern these issues, 
Because often they're at variance, or sometimes they're at variance with one another. And discriminatory provisions, say, for instance, in migration laws and policies, can trigger trafficking or give rise to trafficking. And the third point I want to raise with respect um, uh, to this point is the need to look at not just decisions to move and movement and on-site work, but also the whole question of gender responsive return and reintegration, comprehensive social, economic, cultural, legal reintegration. The sixth point I want to raise is about stay behind women from migrant households. And I want to reiterate this point that was made by an earlier speaker. Stay behind women from migrant households do take on uh, you know, the burden of housework and hold up the rural economy or other kinds of work in the economy. This may not be empowerment, even if they take on male roles, because often, as has been said, their workloads increase, their stress levels increase. They are in very preca precarious situations when remittances are not forthcoming from men or when they are hit by repeated climate crises and there's no one in the family to help them, the men are away, etc. Or when they've lost men in the course of migration, their men folk have gone missing or they've died because they've taken dangerous avenues and routes to migrate. Or if they are burdened and threatened, their security threatened uh, uh, by traffickers and smugglers for ransom because their male folk have been trafficked or smuggled. And therefore, when we want to talk about empowerment or we want to, to ensure that they're empowered, it requires a whole set of initiatives to create a more enabling environment. For instance, uh, the reduction of care work, the recognition of care work, the redistribution of care work, support for women's emotional state, economic empowerment, climate adaptation, mitigation measures for women left behind, support structures or support interventions for children left behind, social norm change among the community to support these women and so on. And this doesn't happen automatically. It requires very deliberate intentional intervention, either by NGOs or community-based groups to see that or ensure that when men retain a return, these changes are sustained in a way that really empower women and you see a transformation in gender role and trait stereotypes and in gender relations that are sustained. And this requires work with men and boys and it requires work with the entire community as well as with women. The last point that I want to make is about women as victims. Uh, and I know that several of you have talked about women uh, as agents and the positive dimensions of migration, but it's all too easy to see women as victims because low-skilled migrant women workers are so badly abused at various stages of migration. But it is important to look at women as agents, as subjects. We need to look at and, and address positive coping. We need to look at good experiences of migration, women's economic empowerment that has not just led to higher incomes, but also helped women better bargain and women have a better status and position. And here I'm talking about power dynamics in the household, in communities, or for instance, good practices in women's representation and leadership. And here we really need to speak to the mobilization of and mobilization by women migrant workers, you know, either through community networks or associations or NGOs. We need to talk about collective bargaining. We need to talk about uh, the, the organization of women migrant workers and by women migrant workers through unions, for instance. Jean, I don't mean to cut you off, but I to summit. And I very quickly. Yeah, I come to the last point. Thank you. And the need, we know what needs what 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 needs to be done, but we really need to share good practices on what works in a nuts and bolts manner. What worked in what context, how and why, including issues that we talked about, like accountability. How do we get uh, you know authorities to address women migrant workers' concerns, financing and the like. Thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, very impassioned and very uh
well informed and particularly like your focus on the last point which we had uh, spoken about earlier in terms of coping strategies and in a gender uh, dimension knowing that there are a lot of diaspora there are a lot of uh, migrant women who are helping other migrant women uh, deal with some of these power symmetries that you spoke about